In the presentation I want to share with you today, it's not really so much about smart grid, but about setting a context for a smart grid, for the work that lies ahead relative to this new technology and what it can do for us as a region and as a world. So to start that, we're, I'm going to take on a bit of a journey, and, and part of the things we'll cover here is, the first is this context, this idea that change is a norm, the new normal is actually changing all the time. But there's a, something different right now, and that difference is that the change we're experiencing is transformational, it's not incremental. And hopefully that'll be one of the points you'll take away. So first I want to start with the lens of my own company. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Vista Utilities, we're headquartered in Spokane, Washington, founded in 1889, we've been there quite a while. We're a combination utility serving customers uh, in both uh, Washington and Idaho on the electricity as well as natural gas side, but we're also a natural gas utility in the state of Oregon. Uh, about 1,800 megawatts of electric generation under management, about two-thirds of that either efficiency or renewable. Now, most utilities innovate to some degree. Ours has a little bit different spin on it. One of the companies you might be familiar with is ITRON. It started out as a metering company. How do you get data to utilities to help it figure things out? Well, that was our subsidiary. You know, it started with two guys. <laughs> Uh, today, they employ about 9,000 people around the world and are the singularly the world's largest supplier of metering equipment to get information, data, right, that can improve utilization for water utilities and their customers, gas utilities and their customers, and electric utilities and their customers. One of our employees came up with an idea about how to modularize a PEM fuel cell. Uh, that company today employs about 80 people in Spokane, Washington, has a uh, product on four continents. Uh, one that I'm particularly uh, enthused about is Advantage IQ. They started out about 15 years ago with just a handful of our employees looking to use technology not to change the world, but to change how customers experience and can use information. In this case, information on their utility bills. So fast forward 15 years, this company aggregates information as the agent, the billing agent for national chain stores. It's data they've had all along, but something happened that technology allows them to do something different. So the first lens I want to leave you with is just that, that technology isn't necessarily the driver, that technology enables things to be done in a different and better way. You see a connection right there to smart grid. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and talk more about this notion that the, ch the norm, the new normal is that change is a constant. And the difference today, though, is that it's not incremental change, it's transformational. But I want to reinforce that it's not just about um, this, this idea that it's a product-centric thing. Whole business are being affected by these same kind of dynamics. And just to give you four quick examples, one is publishing, right? You know, it was this notion of newspaper, traditional media, completely disrupted by things like Craigslist, Amazon.com, where you can do self-publishing today. Or how about television? You know, the incremental change used to be, am I going to watch reruns of uh, I Love Lucy or Two and a Half Men? And now it's, gee, you have all kinds of choices by way of Hulu or YouTube. YouTube is one of the most watched features, highest demand in terms of data, uh, data streams on the internet today worldwide, not television. <laughs> Everybody's got one of these? <laughs> these, things, these things change the world, not just in terms of your ability to stay connected, uh, but also in terms of your ability to have an impact instantaneous access to people, instantaneous access to information, and then finally, uh, music, right, the music industry. So you, you get this, this notion that, boy, whole industries have been transformed, but in every one of these, individual action, finding a better way, it's not the technology that changed it, but the technology made it possible. But the change didn't happen just because of the technology. Something else had to happen, and it had to do with involving people. Keep this in mind. All right, so new lens. I want to put energy in context, because uh, oftentimes we get so caught up in the moment that we forget why we're doing this in the first place. The question is about the burdens of work. And this could be your, depending on your age, your grandmother or your great-grandmother. And it wasn't so long ago that my great-grandmother was washing clothes like this in a wooden bucket. And that was a big part of her life, subsistence living. Along comes electricity, this magic that, oh, by the way, about two billion people on the planet today haven't even seen a light switch. So when you think about the role that you play in shaping the future of energy, you're not just doing it for jobs, you're not just doing it for the goodness and the, of our economy and, and the well-being of, of people here. Helping accelerate or alter what happens in the total world, 
right? By advancing our understanding of how to do things better and better. I promise you, but for electricity, right, you, we'd all be back there subsistence living, right? So this is a powerful, powerful tool that does something that we so often as a people take for granted. And that's a mistake, particularly when everything about shifting the fabric of a culture depends on how people see their role and what they do in it. We're going to get a little bit more granular and now talk about customers. Different lens. I've got some survey data here that I think you'll find interesting. So different lens here for consumer and the interesting dynamic we face. Because remember, the common thread for culture change is still about how people respond, how people think about it and react to it on an individual basis, what's going on around them, the confluence of factors. And it's the collective effect of their response that matters. So here's some survey data. Uh, self-selected people, uh, the people self-selected into the survey who uh, could be, uh, who, who claim to be environmentalists. Uh, they had taken some deliberate action to improve the environment, and that was a pre-screen for these questions. About 1,000 people surveyed across the country two years ago. What's one thing you could do to dramatically reduce your energy bill? What could you do? Upgrade my windows, upgrade my HVAC system, so that everybody knows, this population knows. What have you done to improve your home energy use? Well, I put in some light bulbs and added a setback thermostat. <laughs> okay. If you had a $10,000 to improve, what would you do to improve your household? Yeah? Kitchen, <laughs> carpet, tile, what about energy? No, it's not on the top of the list. Here's a stunning statistic. How much would your energy bill have to go up to push you, to push you to spend more on efficiency upgrades? In 2007, more than $100 a month on your bill stood at 26%. And over three years, in the midst of the deepest recession our country has ever seen, the number of people that have to have more than $100 to be pushed to it has gone up. Huh. <laughs> this is confusing, but we're here trying to say, hey, we got a better way. And we're not seeing that in what people want to do. Is saving energy important? Three out of four say yes. Is, I've completed a home efficiency uh, upgrade or renovation of some kind, one in four. The most important reason to reduce consumption, remember these environmentalists, Lower my bill, three out of four. Do you use more energy versus five years ago? 43% will admit, <laughs> will admit to say, yeah, I do. I suspect the number is really actually higher. Uh, so given the choice between environment, comfort, and convenience, which do you most choose? And you can see the numbers. Essentially two out of three, three out of four always pick comfort and convenience. And yet we're out there talking about the benefits of efficiency and know, are we in sync with the consumers whose individual actions will create a collective effect? As you sort through Smart Grid and the discussions over the next two days, be thinking about the role individuals play on a collective basis. And data like this should give you pause before we just race down the track to be doing too much too soon. Okay, one last lens, and that's the lens of technical and policy uh, I use the word intermediation. These are people with good ideas that say, here's, here's something we should do. Here's a new technology. Here's a better policy. But all of those have implications for what happens in the rest of the world. So we'll just take a sampling of a few of those. Uh, one easy way to think about a uh, smart grid, and many people use this, this uh, as a metaphor, the, the electric grid itself is in some ways comparable to a road, a road system. So if you think about that, so generation, is sort of like the fuel source for the automobile system. Uh, transmission is the interstate highways. Substations are the interchanges. Distributions could be streets and roads. Uh, meters are the fuel gauge. What's missing from this? The consumer, right? That's certainly one. So the, the vehicle has to be there too, but the vehicles always come with a driver. <laughs> Who's driving energy choices in your life, in your community, each household, oh, policy. Wait a minute, we have a policy, and this is what, what Department of Energy has said regarding the ARRA Smart Grid Grant. The things that we're, have benefited us tremendously in our region. The goal is to enable customers to change behavior, to reduce power use, increase efficiency, and match demand for resources, as well as increase reliability of the grid. Great goals, and we are all in on those ideas because it's the right thing to do. That's part of the reason our company teamed up with Bonneville and other utilities in the region to do the Smart Grid Regional Demonstration Project. 
So of course, the, the promise of smart grid is what if everything, all the parts worked in harmony, but oftentimes we leave out this, this critical component of the people, the consumer, the driver. The, we as individuals are the drivers, and we have to be mindful of that in anything we do. So figuring it all out, this is the challenge. Uh, dynamic forces here, the opportunities, one more. Uh, lie in efficiencies, of course, system reliability, uh, decision analysis, better information that we can make better use of the asset. But we have some challenges. Uh, interoperability and safety, how does all the pieces work together? Personal privacy, security concerns, people are working on those right now. Uh, and this last one that I don't know if people are paying enough attention to. Uh, it's one that's pretty critical. And the easy way to illustrate this notion of technology refresh and the risk is easily illustrated by other kinds of technologies. This was the coolest thing on the planet just a few years ago. The iMac came in all kinds of very cool colors. Couldn't really carry one on your hip, though. <laughs> Let's go one more. So here's, here's this one, the iPhone. It has twice the power. It's 92% less in weight, 16 times the RAM, the rapid access memory, eight times the storage at 45% less price. That happened in less than 10 years. If we invest a trillion dollars in the smart grid system and then a better idea comes along, where are we in terms of our economy, our nation? How do we future-proof the investments we make? This is an important challenge. I hope somebody's working. So as we come to the end here, I, I promised I'd share my point of view about what all these trends mean. To my way of thinking, there's these four, I'll call them four trends or four imperatives, that efficiency is crowned king by consumers and utilities ultimately. Because as price continues to rise, it has to trigger a response at some point. Direct use of natural gas, we didn't talk much about this, but the, the most efficient use of energy, the most efficient use of the energy we have, making the best use of what we have becomes the, an important uh, component of whatever this new future holds. New renewable resources clearly are the preferred option. And finally, smart grids, the thing you're all here to work on. Enabled by emerging technologies, they really allow networks to be optimized. And not, net, not just networks of equipment, which I hope is the theme you pick up from me today. It's not just about the equipment, but it's about the people and how they interact with the equipment. And not just the trained workforce who's equipped to handle it all and understand it all, but also the consumer on the other side because they are the drivers of the vehicles that matter. Fundamentally, we, in my view, we're at this kind of a juncture where we have to drive as an industry, as a society, a different personal relationship with energy. We know that the real value of energy comes in, in things that we don't tend to be mindful of, beyond survival, right? relief from the burdens of work, comfort, convenience, entertainment, and this new notion of connectivity that empowers all kinds of futures that we can only now begin to imagine. New policies, no, don't go. New policies and growing demand, of course, are driving these, the marginal cost of new power higher, which means that higher costs re demand these new behaviors. It's got to come. So we're in this midst of a transformation, not incremental. It's a transformation of how we see energy in the infrastructure of our society, the infrastructure of our economy, the infrastructure of the world. It demands a new cultural norm, a new fabric in our culture. And how do we achieve that? How do we achieve that? So as you think about what's going on here in your, this venue today, in the next couple of days, you know, you're, you're thinking about the trained workforce, the capacity of people to help accelerate or make this all work. My invitation to you is to think about it in different terms, different contexts that you, we've shared some of this today. So it leads us to this notion that there's some new core competencies, new, new imperatives, if that's really the situation we're dealing with, this, this radical transformation enabled by this form of connectivity empowered by energy. Engaging and collaborative would be a couple. The next would be inventive and transforming. We have to be thoughtful that way. And the third category is this notion of being systemic and, uh, and sustainable in whatever actions we take. But I, I want to delve in just a little bit to the one that I think is the most compelling core competency, and that's collaboration. And by collaboration, let's define it. Collaboration is not suspending your self-interest. It is choosing to coordinate and cooperate. You gotta have both. <laughs> coordinate and cooperate to create a greater result, result that benefits as well as the other people that you're collaborating with. So I want to illustrate the, the, the impact of what happens and kind of what the conditions are for really effective collaboration. And Barbara is here still somewhere? No. <laughs> I get to pick on you now. 
So one of the things, you know, Barbara does, has been doing this for six years. She does a wonderful job. And I just want to give her a round of applause. Everybody. Okay. okay, so now we're going to do it again, but we're going to collaborate. We're going to coordinate and cooperate in a way that changes how we recognize Barbara. So what I want you to do differently, you ready? I want you to do differently is to applaud again. But this time, I want everyone to applaud at the same time in unison. You ready? Set, go. Okay, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> See, that was easy. <laughs> so what happened there? It took you like less than two seconds to synchronize. How'd that happen? Anybody? You tuned in? Like what? You do. Okay, I'm going to submit that there's three conditions that happened in that experiment. <laughs> the first is we had a shared purpose. Shared purpose. The second is that we had a facilitative leader, someone that was willing to say, ready, set, go. And the third thing was we had both the willingness and the capacity, or capability if you prefer, to act. Don't suspend self-interest, coordinate, collaborate, find shared purpose. With me? <laughs> is this making sense? Find shared purpose. Find the, be, don't find, be the facilitative leader, because facilitative leaders don't have to have a position. They need only express themselves and exercise your individual capacity, your willingness and your capability to act. And if you do that in the context of your regular job and in the context of the experience you're having here, experience learning is what Barbara characterized this as, I think you're not only going to have a wonderful workshop, I think you're going to make a difference in our world and ultimately for humankind in your own small way. And for that, I can congratulate you and appreciate the time to spend with you today. Thanks.